okay so we have finally come to the stage where we are going to construct the system of real numbers so this is chapter 5 now before we start the first section of this chapter um, there are some things a little discussion about uh, what we have achieved so far and why we need the system of real numbers why why do we need to cons um, construct the system of real numbers or move from the system of rationals to the system of real numbers so let us recall what we have done so far briefly we started our journey here with the construction of the system of natural numbers and we define natural numbers using the five piano axioms after that definition we recursively define the two operations of addition and multiplication and then we verified all the familiar laws of algebra uh, that we know are true in this system once that was achieved we then moved on to the larger system of integers now each integer was defined as a formal difference of two natural numbers which after the definition of the operation of subtraction turned out to be equal to the actual difference of the two natural numbers after that we did a similar thing we started from the system of integers and we developed the system of rational numbers here we defined each rational number as a formal quotient of two integers but the usual caveat that the second component y has to be non-zero is there okay which i am not mentioning and once this system was developed to some extent where we were able to define division it turned out that this is equal to the actual quotient of these two integers we are now here in this system we have proved we have uh, verified all the usual laws of algebra that we are already familiar with in this system okay now the question is after this the natural step is to uh, construct the system of real numbers but why why do we need real numbers the author says that the rational system is already sufficient to do a lot of mathematics much of high school algebra for instance works just fine if one knows only about rational numbers so we all we have developed this system entirely i mean at least the uh, rudimentary things the basic things we have developed of this system we are now well equipped to handle many questions that high school algebra poses and we can satisfactorily answer many of them however there is an area of mathematics which uh, we come across in the very beginning of our mathematical education where situations occur that show that this system is inadequate for such situations and that area is geometry simple plain euclidean geometry there itself you come across the situation where you consider a right angled triangle having two sides equal and of length what if you use the pythagoras theorem you find that the length of the hypotenuse is square root of 2 and this is a number whose square is equal to 2 by definition it's a sort of object whose square is equal to 2 for, for that definition however you need the system of real numbers but since we already know i mean we have used the system of real numbers so much so in that sense i am saying it's a re, uh, positive real number whose square is equal to 2 
now we have already proved in the last section of the previous chapter that there is no rational number whose square is equal to 2 no such x in q is there which satisfies this equation so this situation shows that even a, such a simple thing as measuring uh, the length of a straight line segment in ordinary plain Euclidean geometry, our system is inadequate for such a job. So that's why we need to move to the system of real numbers. Now this is, this number you very well know is an example of a number that is not rational means it's called an irrational number. Now the situation becomes even worse once one concentrates on a subfield of geometry, namely trigonometry. In trigonometry also we come across irrational numbers and they look like this these are two examples of irrational numbers pi and cosine of one radian the thing is that why we say the situation is even worse here is because in a very precise sense these numbers although they are also irrational just like this one they are in a sense more irrational there is a classification of numbers which classifies these two types of numbers separately this is an example of an algebraic number and these are examples of transcendental numbers which are in a sense more irrational than algebraic numbers this classification, however, is uh, we, we are not going to discuss anything more about them. Uh, one reason is that we don't need that classification. It's just to show you that the situation becomes more and more uh, unmanageable, even in the system of irrational numbers. The other thing is that it's way beyond the scope of this text. So that's why we need the system of real numbers okay so that means from here we have to make this transition from q to r now there is a problem not carefully how we made the other two previous transitions from the natural number system we moved to the integers to do so we introduced one extra operation, subtraction. We could not have used actual subtraction in the beginning itself. So we used formal subtraction. And then for the second transition, we used such an operation again, formal division. Note that in each of these operations, the operation is new but the components are from the old system a and b are natural numbers x and y are integers and in each case there are two components of the old system involved so that's why these operations are called binary operations where uh, you give two inputs and the operation gives you an output other examples uh, which are more common, uh, I mean which come even before these operations are of course addition and multiplication. You give two inputs, one plus two, it gives you a, an output three. Okay, or you give two inputs, one and two, you, the multiplication gives you the output two. So they are called binary operations. In general, they are examples of algebraic operations we say algebraic because 
An algebraic operation involves finite number of outputs. In these cases, it's two. In other cases, it can be more than two. However, in this transition that we are now going to make, the operation will not involve finitely many rational numbers because that's how we are progressing now. We used natural numbers and one operation to create integers. We used integers and one operation to create rational numbers. Now we are going to use rational numbers and one operation to create real numbers or rather define real numbers. Here however, it will not be two rational numbers but in general infinitely many rational numbers. We are going to consider a sequence of rational numbers and this will give us um, I mean we, we are going to attach an object just like here to these two rational number uh, sorry I mean two integers we attached a new object which we called a rational number whose components are integers just like that here we are going to attach an object to a sequence of rational numbers to infinitely many rational numbers which we are going to call a real number note that and uh, that thing you already know is a limit however just like here we were not able to use actual subtraction and actual division but they are formal versions which later turned out to be the same as the actual one here also we are going to use formal limits something known as formal limits okay so that's how we are going to develop the system of real numbers so this operation of limit is not an algebraic operation it can be called an analytic operation the difference is that how many components of the previous system you are going to use to define a single object in the new system here uh, that number is finite here it's going to in general be infinite hmm. now uh, okay fine so we understand what we are going to do but uh, the thing is that the conceptual the conception of a limit or the notion of limit is somewhat easy to understand conceptually but difficult to precisely pin down simply because infinitely many objects are involved and we should be very careful while dealing with infinity in mathematics in whatever form it appears we should be very careful and this uh, task is in fact so difficult that uh, the author says even such a okay this is not my words okay it's terence tau's words each uh, even such great mathematicians as euler and newton had difficulty with the concept Newton developed calculus geometrically for his purpose of uh, doing calculations in his mechanics that he developed. In those geometric definitions, he often struggled with many things because our geometric intuition is not that great. We, we can normally think of plane geometry or geometry in 3D space quite uh, naturally and effectively and correctly but there are situations we will come across them here in this text itself where our geometric intuitions fail us so that uh, problem is there and euler despite being such a prolific and brilliant mathematician a genius he in fact made uh, many mistakes while he calculated with limits or while he made statements involving limits there are mistakes which were later found by other mathematicians and the state was that limit was considered to be something that 
is natural it and that is in some sense natural also that's why we were saying that the it's conceptually and intuitively quite clear but to actually precisely pin down is quite difficult in other words to put it in as a definition in mathematical terms is difficult because of infinitely many rational numbers involved in the process so that difficulty was overcome in the 19th century by mathematicians as augustine louis cauchy or dedekind who figured out how to deal with limits rigorously so until the rigorous definition of limits that we find today mathematicians just uh, work with limits as they wished or as they felt uh, it's correct okay now this type of gaps that we explored in the last section of the previous chapter in our system of rational numbers we will see that in this new system those gaps are uh, gone okay they are filled in and we get a continuum of real numbers in the sense that you can associate real numbers to the point of an unbounded infinite straight line to the points in such a way that each point on the line gets a real number associated to it say you associate this point to the real number zero then you associate this point to the real number one and you associate other points with other real numbers the thing is that each point will get a real number it's like naming someone the points are like people and the real numbers are like names the fact that this system forms a continuum tells us that there are enough names that while naming the points using real numbers we don't run out of names and uh, the names that we have are all necessary we don't come across a situation where we have run out of points and still names are there so that we have to somehow associate two real numbers to a single point that does not happen in other words there is a one to one correspondence between the geometric points on a line and the set of real numbers okay so that thing is there it's not uh, what i said right now it's not rigorous but you can get my point now it uh, may seem somewhat strange and extremely complicated i mean coming from uh, this type of operations to suddenly involve infinitely many rational numbers to define a real number but uh, once you see what is going on and why we are adopting such a thing to define real numbers you will see that it's quite natural and it's actually a special case of a much more general construction which we will later see at one stage in uh, analysis 2 when we study completion of metric spaces okay so with this we are now going to start the development so let us see what we can do now in the very beginning we have to distinguish the sequences that can be used to define real numbers those sequences of rational numbers that can be used to define real numbers not all sequences of rational numbers can 
are going to be used for our, our purpose. We will see why. But before all those things, we need to define sequences first of all. So this is the first section. And it's called Cauchy sequences. named after the mathematician Cauchy. So it begins with the first definition of sequences. Let M be any integer. Any integer means M can be positive, negative, or zero. It can be any integer. A sequence A N where n varies from 1 to infinity is a mapping from the set of all integers greater than or equal to m into the system of rational numbers. In fact, I should have written a sequence of rational numbers. Let me write here. Let m be an any integer, a sequence of rational numbers, which is uh, denoted by this symbol, is a mapping from this set, that is, uh, it's a mapping with this set as domain and q as range. And this is the set of all integers starting from m and going, uh, moving forward. In other words, or that is, a mapping that assigns to each integer in greater than or equal to M a rational number a n. Okay, so it's a mapping whose image, I mean, uh, it's a mapping under which the image of the integer n is the rational number a in the image is denoted like this a suffix n more informally a sequence is a a sequence of rational numbers is a collection
is a collection of rational numbers. When we are writing a collection of rational numbers, there are two things that need to be co uh, considered here. One thing is that this collection is not a set in the usual sense. That's because there is an order. In set, the elements, I mean, there is, uh, order is not important in a set. The elements can be written in any order. If you are writing the set in roster method, the elements can be written in any order. However, in a sequence, it matters uh, what you write here. That is going to be the image of the input M under the sequence. This is going to be the image of the input M plus 1, this integer, under the sequence. This one is the image of M plus 2. So, if you are just simply going to write, for example, that one, let, let us take that one. Then in this sequence, these are all rational numbers. You, you can see that we don't have any suffix or anything. You have actual rational numbers. So you can write, you can uh, define this sequence like this. It's the sequence here we are taking say m equal to 1 where a n is defined to be 1 by n. So this is the first term you can also say like that this is the first term this is the second term this is the third term and so on. You cannot change the order and write like this. This is also a sequence but this is different from this one. That's because this is a mapping which maps n equal to 2 to the rational number 1 by 3. Where, whereas this the first one is a mapping that maps the integer 2 to the rational number 1 by 2. They are different mappings. So the order is important. That is one thing. And the other thing is that we don't usually repeat an element in a set. However, in a sequence, terms can be repeated. You can have a sequence, in fact, where all the terms are equal. It's the sequence A and there is no need to write just A and you can write B and also where an is the constant uh, function 1. At every integer n, the value of the function is defined to be 1. So this is also a sequence. It also has infinitely many terms. All these are infinite sequences. Although we are not saying the word infinite, but it's understood that uh, the sequences, we have a concept of finite sequences that is different. but here we have infinite sequences. Number of distinct terms can be finite, which in this case for this sequence is 1. There is only one distinct term which is equal to 1. Here the number of distinct terms in both these cases uh, are infinite. However, you can have a sequence like this. where the terms are alternating between 1 and 0. Here the number of distinct terms is 2, 0 and 1. But in every such case, the number of terms is infinite. Okay, so that, that thing we have to understand. So when we are loosely writing informally a sequence like a collection like this then it does not mean a set it's something else here order matters and uh, also elements can be repeated so let us now see some examples 
in fact let's consider this example it will be 5 1 2 the sequence in square where n varies from 0 to infinity is the collection 0 1 4 9 16 25 etc the sequence So these are all the both of them are sequences of natural numbers which are after all rational numbers so this is uh, an example of uh, a sequence known as a constant sequence where all the terms are actually equal these uh, of the individual components of a sequence can be called terms or elements or members also Hmm. And uh, now a word about this M. Where where should we start this label M? Uh, the, we are sort of labeling the terms no? using these integers. So where should we start this? The first input, it's up to us. It can be any integer. In the definition itself, it has been said to be any integer. You can start it at zero. You can take the value of m as high as say 1000 or you can even take minus 1 billion that also you can take you can take any integer value for m so that's what the author says these sequences start from zero or uh, now if i say sequences start from zero then you may think that the values are starting from zero this sequence says or oh, we can write it like this the indices of these sequences start from zero that is the, these are the indices a n n is the index it can start at any integer for example this is the sequence a1 a2 a3 etc this is the sequence b1 
B3, B4, B5, etc. So, So this is the sequence so the where the index starts is our choice Now we want to distinguish the type of sequence that will be used to Define real numbers. We have already said that not all sequences of rational numbers will be used to define real numbers. Some distinguished sequences only can do that job. So we now need to identify such sequences. These are sequences of rational numbers that want to converge to something this part is uh, written within quotes because it is vague vague means if you uh, there is an example for instance this sequence of rational numbers 1 1.4 1.41 etc looking at the terms here we have used the decimal system to represent the rational numbers but you already know that you can uh, write other things in place of these numbers for example one is of course one in, in place of this representation you can write 14 divided by 10 for this one you can write 141 divided by 100 like that okay so looking at the terms of this sequence you can see that the members the further you go down the sequence the members start converging towards something they are trying to converge to something is what thing we don't know that thing is the uh, what we are after what we want to define as square root of 2 if, if you know the decimal expansion of square root of 2 you can realize 
that these numbers are uh, going closer and closer to square root of 2 in the sense that we are including more and more digits from its decimal expansion to this um, approximate values if, if you want to call them so trying to converge to something another easier one is this one as does this sequence 0 0.1 0 0.01 0 0.001 0 .001, etc in this case it's even easier to uh, guess that this sequence is trying to converge to the rational number itself zero the further you go down the sequence, the terms become closer and closer to zero, the rational number zero. However, other sequences are not like that. This is one behavior that some sequences exhibit, but not all sequences are like that. And those are the sequences we uh, will have no use, I mean, at least in uh, defining real numbers however the sequences are do not seem to converge to anything this behavior that the terms of these sequences are showing that they are getting closer and closer to something in the sense that their individual differences are also getting smaller and smaller that is not exhibited by say this sequence where the terms are clearly not getting closer to anything no matter how far we go down the sequence or for example here here the terms are increasing here however the terms are not increasing but the sequence keeps jumping between 1 and 0 it's not settling anywhere here also the terms are not settling anywhere so these are the types of sequences that we will not use to define real numbers we are we want this type of sequences to define real numbers but we have to we have the difficult job of uh, mathematically precisely describing what is happening here that makes us want to use these sequences to define real numbers. That is, we want to make precise this vague statement. It seems that the sequence is trying to converge to something. We have to. Um, make this mathematically precise without saying what this something is in fact we are going to use that precise mathematical definition to define that something that something will be a real number okay so we want to distinguish between this type of sequences and this type of sequences to do so We need the notion of epsilon closeness. That we have 
already come across. Let us recall that for rational numbers x, y, and epsilon, where epsilon is positive. We say that x and y are epsilon flows. If the distance between them, which is the absolute value of their difference, is less than or equal to epsilon. We are now going to use this notion to try to define the type of sequence uh, or try to pin down the type of sequence that we will use to define real numbers. And the first definition actually we want to define Cauchy sequences. We want to say that the types of sequences we have seen two examples of here, they are Cauchy sequences and we can uh, give the definition at once. However, the definition is somewhat complicated and it may take a while to understand and digest the definition properly. So what Tao has done is he has split the definition into several parts and he will then finally combine those parts to define a Cauchy sequence. So in that direction we have the first definition of epsilon steadiness. So this is definition 513 and it goes like this let epsilon be a positive rational number we are not saying rational number because that's all we have right now. We don't have the real numbers yet. So everything we have are in general rational numbers. A sequence A n of rational numbers is said to be epsilon steady if the distance between a j and a k the terms a j and a k That is, okay, we already know how to calculate distance. So let me just try this. If this is less than or equal to epsilon for all natural numbers k and k. Since here the index is taking natural numbers that is non-negative integers so that's why we are saying all natural numbers in other words 
a sequence is said to be epsilon steady if the distance between any two terms of the sequence okay between any two terms of the sequence is less than or equal to epsilon then we say that the sequence is epsilon steady in other words is epsilon steady if and only if aj and ak are epsilon close for all natural numbers j and k that is if all the terms of the sequence are epsilon close to one another you take any two terms of the sequence they are epsilon close that their distance be, uh, and the distance between them is it does not exceed epsilon it stays less than or equal to epsilon then we say that such a sequence is epsilon steady immediately after the definition there is a remark and the remark simply mentions that uh, this definition is not standard because tau has split the definition of Cauchy sequence into parts so this is the first part so you will not find this definition in any other text it's just uh, here for us to it's like uh, splitting a big meal into chunks uh, more easily palatable chunks okay which are easier to digest this definition is not standard in the literature, in the mathematical literature. We will not need it outside this section. Similarly, the notion of eventual epsilon steadiness that is the next part that we are going to define that is also not standard So you can note one more thing that epsilon steadiness has been defined for sequences where the 
index starts from 0 but clearly it can be defined for any sequences where the index starts from a general integer epsilon steadiness for sequences index starts at 0 but clearly for a sequence like this by requiring that the distance between aj and ak be less than or equal to epsilon for all integers j and k greater than or equal to n so that is just a minor thing now let us take a look at an example of this notion epsilon steadiness example 5 1 5. The sequence is one steady. in place of epsilon we can take one because one is a positive rational number and the sequence is one steady because the maximum distance between two terms of this sequence is one and that is between a term that is zero and a term that is one for example between this term and this term the distance is 1 as is the distance between this and this term or for example this one and this one of course if you take 1 and 1 the distance is 0 but always the distance is less than or equal to 1 for any two terms so that's why the sequence is one steady but is not epsilon steady i think for oh, 1 by 2 steady because the distance between 1 and 0 is 1 which is greater than 1 by 2 so the sequence fails to be 1 by 2 steady in place of epsilon we can take 1 by 2 also it is also a positive rational number the sequence 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001 and so on is 0 0.1 steady.
If you take the difference of any two such numbers, you will notice that all such differences are less than or equal to 0 0.1. However, if you calculate the difference between these two, say, or uh, for example, not these two, but the first one and the second one, the first and second term, then it becomes zero point zero nine. Okay, and zero point zero nine is greater than zero point zero one, not less than zero point zero one, or not equal to zero point zero one. So that's why the sequence, although it is 0 0.1 steady, but it's not 0 0.01 steady. For the sequence to be epsilon steady, the distance between any two terms should be less than or equal to epsilon or any two terms should be epsilon close to each other. The sequence 1, 2, oh, so it goes like that 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. is not epsilon steady for any epsilon greater than 0. You can pretty much see why. For this sequence to be epsilon steady, if you take a very small value of epsilon, then immediately you get the uh, confirmation that it's not epsilon steady because the distance between 2 and 1 is 1. So if your epsilon is less than 1, then automatically the sequence is not epsilon steady. However, if epsilon is greater than or equal to 1, then to show that this sequence is not epsilon steady, you just move further down the sequence. From there, you choose two adjacent terms and you calculate their difference. For example, you calculate say, the difference between 16 and 8. that gives you 8. So if your epsilon is less than 8, then using this difference, you can say, yes, it's not epsilon close. And these two are not epsilon close, so the sequence is not epsilon steady. The question is, you can choose a very large epsilon also. Say you can choose epsilon equal to say 10 to the power 10. Then how far down the sequence do you need to go to create a difference that is even larger than this epsilon? To answer that question, you just uh, look at the terms of the sequence. What are the terms? The first term is 2 to the power 0. The second one is 2 to the power 1. The third one is 2 square and so on. So that means if you look at a general term like this, at some stage you will have some term 2 to the power n where n is some non-negative integer and the next term will be 2 to the power n plus 1 and it goes, continues to go like that. You calculate the difference between these two. What do you get? You can take 2 to the power n common out. That will leave you with 2 minus 1, and the, which is 1. So that means this difference is actually equal to 2 to the power n. Now the question is, can you make this difference greater than epsilon? That means you need an n such that this is greater than epsilon. To do this, 
you go back to the previous chapter chapter 4 where we uh, in one section i think the last one or which one i don't remember exactly we proved and i mean we solved an exercise where we proved that for any positive integer 2 to the power n is greater than n and you can use that result from that exercise because you know from interspersing of uh, integers among rationals or rationals among integers i i can't remember clearly but it's that result which tells us that for any rational number x there exists a unique integer n that satisfies these inequalities and we in fact have called this integer the integer part of that rational number if you go to that lemma or proposition whatever it is you will see that a part of the proposition says this also given any rational number x you can find a positive natural number n that is greater than x now you think of epsilon in place of x so for epsilon also you can find a positive natural number n that is greater than epsilon but then by using that exercise 2 to the power n will also be greater than epsilon and this tells you that the distance between 2 to the power n and 2 to the power n plus 1 these two terms in your sequence is greater than epsilon so it does not matter how large epsilon is you can always find two terms in this sequence the distance between them is even greater so clearly the sequence cannot be epsilon steady so it's not epsilon steady for any epsilon you can write these uh, things if you want systematically to justify this fact and the last part of this example gives us a sequence that shows the exact opposite behavior in the sense that it is a sequence which is epsilon steady for every epsilon the sequence which has only one distinct term is epsilon steady for all epsilon greater than zero why it's because the distance between any two terms is zero so clearly which is less than epsilon so it is epsilon steady for every epsilon Okay, so after this we have the notion of eventual epsilon steadiness and then using that one we can finally define our notion of Cauchy sequences but that we will do in another video because I think this video has been quite long um, so I end this video here uh, so see you in the other video if you have any doubt regarding these things that we have discussed today you can always comment me in the comment section below so with that i uh, sign off for today have a nice night